welcome to the 37 video of the Just In Case series sponsored by Quality and Equality, an OD consultancy firm based in Oxford, United Kingdom. And my name is Mei Yan Chung Judge, uh, the founder of the firm. We call the series Just In Case. It's just in case you want to be reminded of something, refresh something or learn something. Today, I'm very excited to introduce you to our contributor, Dr. Marianne Rainey, who is a very well-known international OD and Gestalt uh, thinker, practitioner, educator, and writer. And Marianne um, has supported a huge number of global clients in their work, both in organization and leadership effectiveness. Her own leadership experience as she actually holds very senior position, for example, like a vice city manager and corporate vice president. She also has taught in the strategic agility and innovation program sponsored by Yale University, a school of government and Yale New Haven Hospital. Her, her teaching um, include adjunct professor in executive MBA program in Loyola, Chicago, and her book, Gestalt Practice, Living and Working in the Pursuit of Holism is a very, very important book. Um, for those of you who like to know more about Gestalt, that is a must read. And other appointment as a dean of the NTL program and as the dean and founder of IGO program are all listed in her biography. So I will encourage you to take a look of her biography, her link resources, um, so that you can actually understand the range of contribution that Marianne has made. Today, Marianne is sharing with us her vast knowledge about groups. And you know that many of us think that group work is one of the primary skills that OD consultant need to have. And she take us through the, the relevance, the history of groups and why a group is by definition. So she went even further to share a strategy on how practitioner can work with groups more effectively. I think this video is an essential watch for all OD practitioner because it will help us to understand group dynamics much better. And thank you, Marianne, for sharing with us your wisdom and your in-depth knowledge on group. So over to you. Thank you, Mayan. It is good to participate in this series. It is a true testament to your ongoing commitment to OD theory and practice. Again, I am Mary Ann Rainey. I will talk about groups today their relevance, history, what a group is by definition, and share some of my strategies on how practitioners can work with groups more effectively. When I say practitioners, I include those in organizational behavior, organization development or OD, organization no effectiveness. I'm including leaders and managers, HR professionals, coaches, and those in related disciplines. Groups continue to be a social structure of consequence in organizations and other social systems. The group is still relevant. I mention this because there are murmurs and rumblings about the demise of the group in a few OD circles in particular, and that the time of the group has passed. Expanding knowledge and practice to larger social systems, which is what we have been doing in OD, for the last 25 years or so, and more broadly to the external environment is what is needed and should continue in our work. To question if we are doing enough to increase the study and practice of working with groups is timely and welcomed. 
However, to suggest that group as a fundamental structure of OD work is past its time is grossly misguided. We only have to look at what is happening in organizations today. The need for leadership teams, project teams, cross-functional teams, none of that has diminished. In fact, one of the most popular organizing practices in organizations today, agile teams, is driven by groups. Groups are the petri dishes of organizational learning, I like to say, where creativity is planted and grows in ways that can be applied to larger groups, organizations, and institutions. I'm reminded here of a quote by Peter Block on the work of leadership. Peter says that the work of leadership is to convene community and that work begins in groups. As I prepared for this session, I considered beginning the way I typically do, asking the audience to think of their experience in group, reflecting on how they remember the group starts, how it ends, and what happens between beginning and end. I use the notion of beginning, middle, and end, something that I got from Gestalt practice, to get the audience to understand that a group is a social entity with its own qualities, dynamics, and life cycle, similar to other social structures, such as individuals with stages of life and larger social enterprises with their life cycles. Groups move through stages and phases, sometimes repeating or revisiting those phases and stages. Still, over time, things change in groups. I'm choosing to talk also about my early experiences in groups. I venture to say that all of us had our first experiences in groups in the early stages of our lives. For me, it was my family and my neighborhood. I was in a family group of five children and two parents. I was the middle child. I was part of a group or a subgroup of three older children where I was the youngest, two older brothers, and I was the sister, the youngest. And to add, I had less power, I learned. At the same time, I was part of the younger group of siblings or siblings where I was the oldest with some degree of power over my two younger brothers. But I learned because I was the only girl in my family and because of my gender, my power was different. Then I was part of a structure that consisted of my mother and me because of our gender that was different from the substructure of my dad and my four brothers based on gender. And to the outside world, we were a group of seven family members. I could go on and on. However, the point I want to make is that groups have been with us since we were born and they are not going anywhere. Groups are everywhere and provide great insight about the functioning of human life. Just from talking about my family, you get the idea that groups bring with them a great deal of complexity, power dynamics, shifting boundaries, diversity issues, identity challenges, and much more. Understanding this complexity, its impact on us, especially as practitioners, and how to engage and work with groups is what I will discuss today. Groups are complex, forever changing and in flux. Group is process and requires knowledge and skill of process. 
The beauty of working with groups is that this complexity is manageable and increases our learning both about ourselves as individuals, individuals and groups, and as members of larger social systems. Dynamics and groups represent a microcosm of what is happening in the other parts of the larger systems. Not all aspects of what we learn about groups can be applied to larger systems nor to the individual level. However, the learning, if nothing else, is instructive. The practical nature of groups lies in their size. Some will say two people make a group. Others say you can have three people to have a group. The other, the outside maximum number for a group ranges from 13 to 20 people for some. Other scholars and practitioners will say 36 makes for the outside size of a group. Regardless of where you land as to the optimal size, what can be said is that a group should be a size that allows for trust and psychological safety, conversation and dialogue, inclusion and foster feelings of belonging. Participation in groups provides an opportunity to increase our self-awareness. I want to provide some historical context of groups. And I often begin not uh, in the Western world, but in the Eastern world with General Sun Tzu and his book on Art of War around 500 BC. And that book is still being used today around the world where he wanted to understand groups, understand the enemy. So he, he, wrote about how to understand groups and the enemy as part of his leadership. We also find groups in, in, in terms of beginning in World War II and in World War I. In World War I, I'll start. Group psychology, again, began to understand the enemy. In World War II, we see a different focus. It's group psychotherapy focusing on individual therapy for wounded soldiers. It was Wilfred Trotta in about 1914 who talked about the natural tendencies of humans to want to be in groups. He called it the herd instinct, where large numbers of people would act in the same way. Today, we see that in this whole concept of flash mobs. And even though Sigmund Freud focused on the individual in psychotherapy and psychoanalysis, he did begin, he began to talk about the group in terms of leadership in particular. He called it the primal horde, where the male dominated the group, controlled the group, and claimed females. Here we see the beginning of discussions about diversity in groups, even though we didn't call it that. Sigmund Freud also, being true to himself, spoke about libidinal energy, which he referred to as the binding force of the group. All of these things suggest to us that a group is different, that a group is distinct as a social entity. It is Wilfred Bion in the UK around 1961 from his papers uh, coming out of the Tavistock Institute, uh, talking about the Tavistock method and group relations. He talked about leadership and authority and offered us something that we still use today. And that's the notion of the basic assumption group and the work group. The basic assumption group is unconscious it is a closed system. It gets in three primary frames of mind, according to Beyond. Dependency, fight or flight, and pairing, either pairing in terms of 
symbiotic partners or differentiated individuals who engage in conflict. And he says this basic assumption group is different from the work group that is conscious and aware of its environment because it is an open and not a closed system. S.H. Folks around 1957, who was a colleague of Beyond, was the first to use the expression group process. And this takes me back to what I said in my intro about beginning, middle, and end. Folks said that groups begin someplace and end in another place. And it's based on the pattern of interaction that he noticed. For very practical purposes, let me focus a bit on groups and organizations. I want to talk about Mary Parker Follett and her foundational work in the early 1900s. Uh, literature will tell us that she did not get as much credit because of her gender, but she focused about the importance of acknowledging groups and organizations. And then there's the iconic work of Elton Mayo and his studies and the Hawthorne studies that began oh, the late 1920s into the 1930s, where he talked about the benefits of groups and organizations and interpersonal and social interaction in the workplace and the, the importance of the leader to the group. However, the person that uh, we talk about a great deal, both in my Gestalt work and at NTL, is the work of Kurt Lewin. Kurt Lewin uh, really embraced the concept of holism from his work at the Berlin School with the Gestalt psychologist, where he really confirmed his theory of psychodynamics with the research done by his student, Bluma Zagarnik. We all know, or most of us are familiar with if we don't finish something psychologically, we stay tied to it until we complete things. Lewin uh, really began looking at antisemitism, racism. He even began studying gang fights and led to his whole concept of group dynamics. Kurt Lewin inspired T-group or sensitivity training that figures greatly into the work of the National Training Laboratories and NTL which is a non-therapeutic group to improve interpersonal and social skills. In fact, the National Training Lab Laboratories and the field of OD was founded as a credit to Lewin's phenomenal work on groups. What is a group? Let me referred to a quote by Wilfred Beyond. He says, we may observe individual gears, springs, and levers, and only guess at the proper function. But when the pieces of, of machinery of, are combined, they become a clock, performing a function as a whole, a function impossible for individual parts to achieve. Therefore, I say, a group is an entity or organism different from the sum of its parts. I'm not saying it's better than the sum of its parts. It's just different. There's a different dynamic. I also offer that a group is a system that has a relationship with its environment. I'm often asked, what is a group? And what is a team and how do they differ? A team can be characterized as a group, as a group of people possessing various skills, experiences, competencies, and who are jointly responsible for achieving a collective goal. A team is a group, but a group is not necessarily a team. Team members have to work together and in the same direction, concentrating their energy into pursuing the same aims and fulfilling the common goals of the team. I often like to 
compare a group, a team, and what I call an aggregate. So let me begin by making a distinction among those three. I'll start with an aggregate. An aggregate is just, is simply a collection of individuals. Oh, we're standing at the bus stop, a group of us. We're an aggregate. An aggregate is someone in the queue, a group of us in the queue, waiting to go into the store. An aggregate are a group of people joining in the dining hall in, at work, an aggregate. A group, by comparison, has some identity. They interact. They have some common interests, and they may have common goals. Now, a team has a common vision. They have the other things, an aggregate and a group those have, but they have a common vision. They have shared accountability. They have coordinated effort and they have integrated expertise. They work like that clock that Beyond talked about. What I have when I look at an aggregate is some, well, you don't have interdependence. Maybe there's some, but interdependence increases as we go from an aggregate to a group to a team. So does common commitment. You have more when you go from an aggregate to a group to a team and accountability increases when we move from an aggregate group and a team. This will give you some idea about the distinction between just a collection of people to a group of people who are, who are together, have some identity. And by the way, we can be members of a group by choice. We can be members of group not by choice. I am in a gender group. I am in an ethnic group, but that's not my choice. I also belong to a network of practitioners. I chose to do that. A team is different from a group, and most often we are either we accept our membership in a team over a long over the long term or we don't. But I hope you have a sense of the distinction between especially a group and a team. I want to offer three things, three again, three essentials for the intervener when working with groups, because we always begin with self as practitioners, as leaders, when we're working with groups. Then I wanna talk about the difference between facilitation and process consulting, which is the term I want to, expression I want to introduce now. And then I want to share my thoughts about what to observe when working with groups. Three essentials for the practitioner when working with groups. The first one is awareness. The second one is use of self. And the third is personal presence. Awareness, of course, awareness of self is first. To learn about your biases, your strengths and weaknesses. And when it comes to groups, even if you like working with groups, there are some of us who prefer doing therapy or coaching or supervision one-on-one. -on -one. There's some who really like large group interventions. And then there are others who like third-party interventions, working with conflict. Get in touch with your biases, your preferences or not for working with groups. That'll help you understand and better pre prepare yourself for doing this work. Next is use of self. Knowing your experience is a valid source of data and information in our work. That, that is what use of self is about. I have some experience when I'm working with my clients. What do I do with experience? Use of self in OD is valid. We give you permission to do that, or it gives us permission to do that. However, understanding when my experience might be useful in advancing the work of the client is critical. The leader, a coach's, or consultant's experience can be a distraction. Sharing 
experience must be in service of the work of a group or a team. I want to use myself. For instance, I'm feeling confused right now about what's going on with this group. Do I use myself and share that with the group or do I hold it? Being choiceful and intentional about use of self is very important. So the second essential was use of self. The first was awareness. The third essential comes from Gestalt practice and we call that personal presence. How I use myself is my presence. It is use of self with intention. And it's not about how professional you are, rather it is about how grounded and relational you are. Teaching the client and groups and teams in very practical terms is what you must do to build a critical mass of effective team builders so that you eventually, and you may not like this, work yourself out of a job. That's what we do. We go in and we teach groups what we know. We teach them how to do what we do so that we move to another part of the system. And I know that's a provocative proposition, but I'm encouraging you to try it. Also, when I talk about personal presence, I'm talking about making a difference with your presence by providing what Edwin Nevis taught us at Gestalt. You want to provide what is missing. For example, if a system that works nonstop and is so action oriented that they can't, they don't even have a sense of themselves, using yourself to make a difference is asking yourself, do I have the courage to move slowly, to teach the client, to teach this group that a slower pace is an option? So those are the essentials of intervening when working with groups, awareness, use of self and personal presence. The next thing is understanding the work that you do. It is beyond facilitation. Facilitation is about uh, what we anticipate is going to happen in the group, designing, creating an agenda, assigning roles, someone for the parking lot, someone to take notes, someone to keep time, someone to observe, someone to record. Those are all roles that we have come to know and associate with facilitation. I'm going to introduce you to what we do when working with groups. We become process consultants. We observe, we use ourselves, we create a personal presence, we raise awareness, we intervene, we provide feedback. We do process consulting in groups. We can do facilitation, but our work is primarily about what is happening in the here and now, making ourselves aware of that and relating that to the work of the group. There are two types of issues that can be found in the group. Content issues and process issues. Content issues, really it seems obvious, is about what the group is working on. Are we going to move to smaller offices? Are we going to set up an office in India? Are we going to downsize? It's the subject matter of what we do. It's the content of the work of the group. How that group goes about attending to that content is called process. And there are two subheadings. One is task process, and the other is maintenance process. So let me just, just go back. We have content issues and we have process issues. Under process, there are two subheadings. We have task process, 
which is about how do we get this work done about setting up an office in India. Maintenance process, how we are relating to each other as we talk about the task of setting up an office in India. You want to focus on the task as part of your process because you want to complete the task, but you also want to attend to the group dynamics. I want to share some thoughts about what to attend to when you're doing process consulting. Uh, distinguishing first between content and process, an under process, task process, and maintenance process. One of the easiest things, if you're working from awareness, to be mindful of are communication patterns. Uh, communication patterns, who talks to whom, how often, how long, whom do people look at when they speak, who agrees with whom, disagrees with whom, who talks after whom, who interrupts homes, whom, whose ideas are acknowledged or co-opted or appropriated. And by appropriated, I mean someone else taking someone else's ideas as their own. We see it all the time in groups. Someone will say something, then later someone will say the same thing. The first person did not get acknowledged. The second person did. Uh, in popular lingo, what's up with that? That's what the practitioner wants to attend to. What are the common characteristics of individuals who speak most often? Are there newer members? Are there senior members of the team? Are they all leaders and managers? What are the communication patterns and behaviors with leadership? How is the group relating to leadership? When the leadership speaks, do the, does everyone go silent? Look for language and things and metaphors because they tell us a lot. Those are some of the easier things if you're working from awareness. One of the most difficult things to attend to in groups, if you're not mindful, that is how decisions are made. Are they made, for instance, when one person makes a suggestion and then another one agrees and voila, we have a decision. You have a decision, but it's not a group decision and it defies the definition of a group. Those are some things you want to attend to. Content and process, task process, maintenance process, communication patterns, decision-making. I want to add leadership, power and authority diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, and stages of group development. And you also want to tend to your use of self and personal presence. The question I'm always challenged by is, but Mary Ann, not everything is obvious in groups. What are your thoughts about that? What are your strategies for that? We have strategies for working with the not so obvious and covert processes that comes out of the work of Bob Marshak. I just love that work, by the way. Theories of um, groups that, especially from uh, psychoanalysis, help us make meaning. That's, that's how we got stages and phases of groups. That's how we got uh, the herd instinct and the work from, from Sigmund Freud because they gave us some theories to help us make meaning out of the complexity of dynamics and groups. We have a number of those theories coming from Schultz who talks about um, we begin somewhere, he calls that the inclusion stay, going through the middle to control, to affection. So we look for inclusion in the beginning or lack thereof and control in the middle or lack thereof or affection at the end. One of the most uh, practical um, 
models of groups that I love. And some people don't like it because they think Tuckman's model is just uh, too simplistic. But whatever we can support our clients to understand the groups, I'm all for it. And Tuckman's work is is valid and it's credible. There's been research done on it. He talks about making meaning out of groups. The beginning is forming, storming, norming, performing, and later he added adjoining or transforming because all groups um, don't end, not every group ends. Then you have the work of uh, Beyond that we've talked about. We have Bradford and Huckabay who talks about membership, uh, confrontation, individuality, and collaboration. All of these theories that we have, none is 100% uh, complete, but they're all helpful in making meaning out of what's going on. In Gestalt, we just simply say, look for the beginning, middle, and end. Attend to levels of system. Uh, you have yin and yang perspectives on what's happening in groups. So you get, get you a theory that helps you make meaning based on your gut feeling. Not everything is going to display itself in groups. So we have to trust these theories to help us understand what's going on in groups and check it out with the group. That's the best way we can know. And I love the work, as I said, by Bob Marshak. He really simplifies the whole idea of covert and overt processes in groups. And I would suggest that you read his work. But these are some ways that you can make meaning out of what's not so obvious in groups. One particular intervention strategy that has proved so successful for me and has gained a lot of popularity whenever I present it or teach about it is the four roles of the Gestalt intervener. And those four roles really tap into uh, self-awareness and personal presence, use of self, it really moves us to being aware of the other and the broader environment. It allows space for us to use some of these theories that help us make meaning out of the com complex group dynamics. And it also helps us uh, intervening in groups, which is what we want to do. I often think about uh, intervening in groups as the practitioner's way of influencing the group uh, because OD really shies away from power and influence. And I said it, we shy away from power and influence. We don't want to own that we actually are there to try to shape and change organizations. We say we don't, but we really do. The four roles of the Gestalt intervener gives us permission to do that. The first role is to experience. The second one is to notice. The third one is to grand theorize. And the fourth one is to influence. The first one, experience. To experience focuses on the practitioner themselves. What's going on with me? What am I experiencing? And how do I want to share this? in service of the work of the group. Remember, everything you do is in service of the work of the group. It is not about you, but it is about you if you do not use your presence effectively or if you use it effectively. So the first one is to experience. The next one is to get outside of yourself and to notice. You can't experience what members of the group are going through or what the group is going through. You have to guess, but you notice to try to decide what is going on with an individual or a subgroup or this group as a whole. Once you notice, then you can begin to use the theories that we talked about to help you 
understand some of the covert as well as the overt processes and dynamics that you're seeing with what we call a grand theory. You grand theorize. Oh, I am thinking that this group now is trying to uh, get to know itself. That's a grand theory. Or it can be like a theory. When this group takes time to include all voices, it moves forward. Do you see the theory? When the group does this, this is the impact. That's a grand theory as well. A grand theory can also be a metaphor or using a figure of speech. So that's the third way of intervening, the role of the Gestalt intervener. The fourth one is to actually influence, is to say something or suggest something uh, that you think will help the group in its work. For instance, I'm suggesting that maybe you should all just stop what you're doing and take a look around the room. That is a way to influence the group, to take in everyone there. Or another influencing intervention is, I'd like to get a statement from each one about what you think is happening in this group. So the group will have an understanding of where it is and where its members are at any given time. So to review, the four roles of the practitioner, to experience self, make choices about how to use that experience of self in service of the group, to notice the group, patterns, recognizing patterns, and you can speak to those, to grand theorize using metaphors or if and when kind of interventions, and to actually intervene making suggestions. All four are interventions. And if you want to start someplace, practice the four roles of the intervener. To summarize, a group can be conceived as existing in a field of forces that connects the group members to each other and to the broader environment. Groups are a social structure in and of themselves with their own qualities. A dynamic tension occurs between leadership and followership in groups. Followership is not guaranteed even for leaders in formal power. It must be earned. There are conscious and unconscious levels of group experience. The many theories of groups help us make meaning out of these dynamics. Recurring themes and patterns can be anticipated. According to research, about 80% of the time, the good news is that 20% of the dynamics are emerging in the here and now. And we should work with those out of awareness. Let me speak just quickly about virtual teams. Virtual teams face hurdles of technology, language, time zone differences, culture, fatigue. However, similar to face-to-face -to -face groups, effectiveness requires attention to interpersonal and social dynamics, and it can be done. In my work with virtual teams, the emotional piece really can show up. Be mindful that interventions do not distract from the work of the group. You want to be clear, concise, get in there and get out so that the group gets back to its work. Be aware of levels of system. So focus on the group without attention to individual, interpersonal, dyadic and subgroup dynamics will not give you the best outcome. Remember that groups evolve and develop. However, the journey is not linear with stages and phases recurring for various reasons. I want to end with this mandate to practitioners. Again, I'm talking about leaders and managers, 
OD consultants, diversity professionals, HR professionals. What we need today are practitioners who participate constructively as members and leaders of groups and teams to increase your own practitioner self-awareness. We need practitioners with skills and tools to work with groups and teams on a range of platforms, virtual and face-to-face. -face. We need practitioners who help clients learn about groups and teams in order to function more effectively in groups and teams. And we need practitioners who transfer their knowledge and skills to their clients so that they can function effectively in their absence. Thank you, it's been my pleasure. On behalf of everyone, may I thank Marianne for leading us through this important topic of group and what's sitting with me is particular, the four basic roles of intervener and how important it is for us to get comfortable in that with our practice. I'm grateful for also your time, the viewer, and sure that many of you have learned huge amount from Marianne's video. So Marianne, may I extend a, a heartfelt gratitude to you for putting your time and effort in this video. And for the viewer, may you um, continue to practice OD in a very professional way um, to maintain civil society and contribute to organization effectiveness. So keep well, keep safe.